And, and I'm going to jump ahead because it fits better here. Our felonious government just fits better here. And what does our government do in our name? By the people, and for the people, and of the people. They lie to us, right? They've been lying to us about UFOs until the other day, a few months ago. They've been lying to us about everything for a real long time as a plan and a pattern of misinformation, propaganda. I mean, we can go back and look historically of when that happened, usually 50 years after everybody's dead. That's why those old history books are so valuable, because they didn't get altered by the new history and the, oh, maybe we don't want to see it that way anymore. But the truth doesn't change because we change. The truth stays what it is. How we interpret it can change, certainly. Um, but what else does our government do in our name? Well, they dig through people's trash. They do that domestically and internationally to see what's in the garbage so they can blackmail people, you know, or otherwise be able to manipulate people. Um, we also, you know, do things, the CIA did a lot of this, they still do this. In fact, Epstein was probably a big part of this. See, people go, where did he get $500 million? That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money, but B B-1 bombers, $2 billion, $2,000 million. So $500 million is pretty cheap money. If you can sexually extort, you know, a hundred corporate and political leaders from around the world, that might come in handy. That's worth a lot of bombers, if you ask me. But don't ask me. Ask the CIA and the NSA and the rest of them, because this is what they do. Why Hale Boggs was so angry at the FBI when he died with my dad on a plane was because they were bugging his office and all of his colleagues, the FBI under Hoover, checking their mail, tapping their phones, and blackmailing whoever they could for that little worm, that little bureaucrat, to run way too much government. How do you think he made it through Republicans and Democrats and everyone else? Because he had them by the short hairs, you might say, is what was going on there. And he ran too much of our government. And Hale Boggs wanted his butt out and said it on the floor of the Congress that very year on my father's birthday, April 6th. Go look it up. But he was gone. He was gone. Hoover had quit. But the institution was as ugly and corrupt as it ever was because he built it and the whole leadership of it all the way down through the ranks had his stench associated with what they were doing. And there were exceptions, but they had no whistleblowers, you know, except maybe Deep Throat, who managed to get out of the FBI a little information on how corrupt it was going with the Nixon administration and what was happening then. You know, that's when the Pentagon Papers were being released. You know, who was releasing was Mike Gravel, the senator from Alaska. And the next race, the next one my dad was in, was going to be in the U.S. Senate against him to get him out of there. You know, these guys were doing things, and things weren't getting disclosed in the right way. Things were falling apart, and what we saw was a tip of the iceberg. We never got the truth because they just killed them all. Kennedy was the first one talking about the deep state. It wasn't Republicans. It wasn't Trump. It was John F. Kennedy, look it up, and his brother, Robert, warning about the deep state then, about the corruption, Eisenhower, warning about the corruption that would come out of the military-industrial complex. I remember in the early 70s hearing my parents talking about the most corrupt people of all were the military-industrial complex. They were handing out bags of money. My dad would be sitting in the congressional restaurant and the maritime union sliding a stack of money across the table and my dad and his campaign manager grabbing it and opening it up for everyone to see and saying, oh, a campaign contribution from the maritime union. It's too bad, you know, not the maritime, the shipbuilders. Too bad, shipbuilders. He was a union man, but thank you for the contribution, announcing it to all of his colleagues right in the middle of the restaurant. 
You know, when, the, when one guy came in and tried to bribe my dad, he grabbed him by the back of the collar and the seat of the pants, and he wasn't a violent man, but that guy did a little skidding operation down the hallway of the Longworth building. Things were different then, you know. My dad didn't get mad. He didn't even swear. You know, I'm amazed I made it through 10 hours and I haven't done it yet. But, but I can tell you something about integrity and honesty and commitment. It gets outraged at what my dad was just beginning to see. And he was only there two years. He got elected to two terms. But he was already dead when he got elected the second time. That's how popular a man he was in this state. He was missing. He was gone. But he won his election by what today would be considered a landslide. And the guy he beat is the guy who ran later again in a special election and has been there for 50 years as the longest serving congressman in U.S. history. And we'll see who goes next. But the point I'm making is history is made by you and me. And I got to see it happen here a little bit. But the government has been working against us in a lot of ways in our name. Extortion and blackmail. Is that who we are? I don't think so. How about theft and breaking and entering? They do that routinely. It's one of the methods. Then they set up their taps. They do roving wiretaps. Just go through neighborhoods and randomly collect data. That's the government we have now. How about sexual blackmail? You know, that's, a, that's the Epstein pattern, you know, and that's what a lot of governments do. China does it, Russia does it, U.S. does it, they all do it. Hey, that's a good place to exploit people, you know, get them in their sexual deviance. Or just the fact they're married and they're having sex with someone that isn't their wife or their husband. Yeah, pretty easy to blackmail and manipulate people. Our government's really good at it. Bribery and corruption, we do that all over the world. In fact, one of my family members was working in Egypt during a set of elections a number of years ago. And one of the revolutionary parties that was involved in that election, they, if you remember, they got a bunch of NGOs, non-governmental groups. A lot of Americans got you know, grabbed up and held. Now, now, my brother Mark was in the U.S. Senate at the time, and my brother Tom wasn't. And he said, Tom says, hey, Mark, you know, why don't you just tell Obama to cut off the money for all the Egyptian generals. This will get fixed right away. That's what happened, right? In a few days, everybody got loose. Because they bribe all these people. They bring them here for war games and training, and then we pay them off and send it off to the Swiss accounts. All you got to do is cut the cash flow. Hey, everybody gets attentive. But is that right? Now, if you as a businessman try that somewhere in the world, they'll arrest you for bribery and corruption, even though you're not on American soil. But the Constitution doesn't go there. But you do. How does that work? But our government can do the same thing and get away with it, but you can't. But every other government can, and everybody else can, that you're competing with worldwide. I can give you examples of how that is, but I won't, because it'll cost too many people their business. Because if I told you what happened in these various countries that we're supposed to have an equal playing field on and we don't, they wouldn't get to work in those countries anymore with their businesses. But they're not paying the bribes, they're just not getting the local business. That's a shame. We're not on an equal playing field in the world because most governments are openly corrupt and ours is covertly corrupt. Ah, oh, so we feel good about it. You know, we don't do bribery anymore, we do campaign contributions. We just give it a new name, gives it a nice feel. Feels good, doesn't it? I've contributed. What? You know, here we are in Alaska having this conversation. Last U.S. Senate race, I think about $50 million got spent to convince 200,000 voters how to vote. Right. And it wasn't money from here. It was money from somewhere else because every U.S. Senator is worth it. And here we got no population at all. Hey, this is a great investment if you want to own the Senate. You come here and you buy Alaska senators, because they're cheap. You only have to convince a few hundred thousand people that you're right. But this is how the game is played by special interests. How many senators do you have? There we are. You know, who writes law? We're going to get into that later. But I want to finish the corruption part, because we haven't gotten through the list of felonies that we're all responsible for. 
bribery and corruption, political interference. There's a good one. We're all mad at the Russians. Did they really interfere with our elections? You know, we interfered with every single election everywhere in the world for the last 50 years, every single one of them, including Brexit with Trump, Trump's involvement in that and Obama's involved with that. Now, if that's not interference, I don't know what is. We're telling another country what to do. We get involved in elections. We get involved in candidates. We do that all the time routinely. And why should we be surprised when it happens here? We shouldn't. We should expect it. And because we should expect it, why the hell weren't we ready for it? Why do we have automated voting in the first place that could be susceptible to any interference where any one of us should doubt the outcome of an election? We don't do that here. Here we do ink on a ballot. Yeah, it runs through a machine, but if we're not happy with the count, both candidates have an observer looking over the shoulder of every counter, and they're counting those votes by hand. And these machines and those hand counts these days aren't off more than one or two votes ever lately. Take a look at the record. But you can go to a record and you can touch it. And you know you could make it even one better if you just a two-part ballot with a number attached so you pulled it apart. Then you could even load the full information up somewhere later and say, hey, did I really vote that way? But automating any of it without keeping the hard copy is a mistake. And don't tell me about uh, blockchain or any other nonsense. If it's in a system, it can be manipulated unless it's on a piece of paper, bound in a book, and real. All right? Make it real, not digital. Make that real, keep that real, or you'll lose your democracy, you'll lose your republic, you'll lose whatever you think you're voting on. And that's what's going on here. Political interference, we do it by design. We make sure these machines can be screwed with because we want to screw with the other guy's election. If you're listening somewhere else in the world, hey, so what if it takes you three months to count the votes? Elections are in November. You swear people in in January. You already have three months. Take the three months. Make sure you have confidence in the process. Political interference. How about kidnapping and torture? That made a lot of news a few years ago. Any of you feel like you're a kidnapper and torturer? Well, you all are. So am I because our government does this in our name. The Epstein world I have already covered. And then I ask you this. Is science and the way we handle this, and is secrecy the right way to handle this? And is that what preserves a republic, secrecy? Because we've allowed the secrecy syndrome now to expand way, way beyond its boundaries, to basically be the cover your ass program there's number one for swearing today, I guess. All right, but that is it. It's a, it's a CYA, man. It's all about that. And let's do it by committee so there's no individual to blame here. And that's what we're seeing play out. Let's make it complicated so no one can figure it out. It doesn't work anymore. We're all pretty angry about it anymore because we feel like it's been taken from us because it has. Only it, it's like the boiling frog, you know, you throw them in the pot, turn the temperature up, just wait, and he never hops out, just boils to death. Or the better one was Chuck Harder's example of the salami, you know, one slice at a time until the salami's all gone. And that's what our democracy and our republic has been about, one slice at a time until the bologna is all gone, actually, and then we're just full of it, right, because we bought this stuff. And we've accepted it incrementally on the installment plan. And, and it's happened not overnight. This happened over a few generations. Because it's the only way it could happen. Because there's at least two generations usually with our heart beating at the same time. Because we're not dying at 40 anymore. And that's important if you think about it and how it plays out. When, when I think about the government again um, and talking about uh, and to kind of wrap up uh, the surveillance, it's time to turn the cameras the other direction. Every government office, state, local, municipal, federal, unless you're dealing with somebody's health care or something that truly is confidential, like an ongoing lawsuit or something, hey, we need to point those cameras the other direction. We need to see what our employees are doing throughout government. Every classroom in America should have a camera in there that every parent should be able to see what their kid is doing and not every pervert. 
but every parent. And how come? Because then you can see if the teacher's doing their job or if little Johnny is screwing off and you can deal with that at home because uh, teachers won't. But parents will. How about running that in the background instead of entertainment when you're at work? What's Johnny doing at school? Is the teacher doing their job? And hey, teacher, if you're too uncomfortable with that, you don't like the scrutiny of the public, then don't be a public employee. Go work somewhere else. Go do something else. If that's too big of an invasion on your personal privacy, when you're taking the responsibility of programming our children, you get to pull your pants down in public as a teacher and expose yourself to whatever you're teaching. Because if you can't expose yourself to whatever you're teaching, then maybe you're teaching something that either you can't tolerate or shouldn't be tolerating too. And I would challenge you on that. What do you have to hide? After all, you work for me and everyone else. And I think good teachers would be proud to show what they can do. I know they would, because I had a lot of good teachers in my life, including my parents, who were professional teachers as well. The other thing about that is looking at where we're headed. You know, are we headed, you know, for the medical passport, the digital currency, all that? Yeah, I wrote about it 20 years ago. It's here right now. We're watching it unfold in front of us as the gateway into your life to barge into your personal life. Remember HIPAA, the right to keep all your medical stuff private? Now they're going to database it. Great. Without any safeguards for you. In fact, the opposite. No safeguards for you at all. You're just a commodity now traded in a different way. And that takes us into the next way. It's called the medical industry. 18% of the U.S. economy and growing. I'll bet you it's 25% with all this COVID money flying around and how little of the regular economy is working. And you got to strip out the finance money because that's just puff money. It's going into the same pockets at the end. We are sitting on the brink of disaster here. The money that's been dished out a few trillion more, this is going to have a very different impact. My oldest son pointed this out and he's dead on right. The earlier impact of spending all the money under Trump, it finally hit the finance sector mainly. Didn't buy a lot of consumer goods. You know, people were busy just hanging on to everything and whatever money came down or, you know, trickled down there um, didn't stay very long. You add up all this money, the trillions and trillions that have been spent, this is like $65,000 per household. If they had just given every household of four about 65 grand, I don't think anybody would be worrying about much for a few years. But that isn't the way it played out. In fact, not only would they not be worrying, those people would actually be spending the money in an economy, creating economic activity. Okay, now that's about to happen, only differently. They got a $2 trillion infrastructure bill that's about to happen. Well, there aren't enough trained people to do any of that work. There's not enough truck drivers. They're already short. They can't even deliver the freight they've got. Things are backed up like crazy in the middle of this thing. They don't have enough professional truck drivers, equipment operators, welders, any of those skilled crafts, because we haven't been educating for that. We're, we don't have that. And those that do show up are going to inflate the price of that labor. And all the materials that aren't available right now to do construction, lumber prices have almost doubled. Most commodities are on the way up. Go take a look. They just didn't have the consumer price index yet. They will. That's a six-month to one-year lag. Wait and see when you start seeing double-digit inflation on things you really need and the stuff you really use. Because now it's being spent on things that are going to compete with what otherwise consumers consume. And so it's different. It's not just money going into puff world. Now it's going to go into a world that causes inflation and causes other unanticipated consequences that are really predictable. Um.